Hi, it's me, Mitch, with some more Queer by William Burroughs. Lean turned down Kauahula, walking with one foot falling directly in front of the other, always fast and purposeful, as if you were leaving the scene of a holdup. You passed a group of expatriate uniform, red check shirt outside, the belt, blue jeans and beard, and another group of young men in conventional, if shabby, clothes. Among these three recognized a boy named Eugene Allerton. Allerton was tall and very thin with high cheekbones, a small bright red mouth and amber-colored eyes that took on a faint violet flush when he was drunk. His gold brown hair was differentially bleached by the sun like a sloppy dying job. He had straight black eyebrows and black eyelashes, an equivocal face, very young, clean cut, and boyish, at the same time conveying an impression of makeup, delicate and exotic and oriental. Allerton was never completely neat or clean, but you did not think of him as being dirty. He was simply careless and lazy to the point of appearing, at times, only half awake. Often he did not hear what if someone said a foot from his ear. Allegra, I expect, thought Lee sourly. He nodded to Allerton and smiled. Allerton nodded as if surprised and did not smile. Lee walked on, a little depressed. Perhaps I can accomplish something in that direction. Well, ever... He froze in front of a restaurant like a bird dog, hungry, quicker to eat here than buy something and cook it. When Lee was hungry, when he wanted to drink or a shot of morphine, delay was unbearable. He went in, ordered steak a la Mexicana and a glass of milk, and waited with his mouth watering for food. A young man with a round face and loose mouth came into the restaurant. He said hello, Horace, in a clear voice. Horace nodded without speaking and sat down as far from Lee as he could get in the small restaurant. Lee smiled. His food arrived and he ate quickly, like an animal, cramming bread and steak into his mouth and washing it down with gulps of milk. He leaned back in his chair and lit a cigarette. All cafe solo, he called to the waitress as she walked by, carrying a pineapple soda to two young Mexicans in double-breasted pinstripe suits. One of the Mexicans had moist brown pop eyes and scraggly mustache of greasy black hairs. He looked pointedly at Lee, and Lee looked away careful. And Lee looked away. Careful, he thought, or he will be over here asking me how I like Mexico. He dropped his half smoked cigarette into half an inch of old coffee walked over to the counter, paid the bill, and was out of the restaurant before the Mexican could formulate an opening sentence. When Lee decided to leave some place, his departure was abrupt. The ship Ahoy had a few phony hurricane lamps, a way of nautical atmosphere, two small rooms with tables, the bar in one room, the hour high, the four high precarious tool stools, the place was always dimly lit and sinister looking. The patrons were tolerant but in no way bohemian. The bearded set never frequented the ship ahoy. The, the place existed in borrowed time without a liquor license under many changes of management. At this time, it was run by an American named Tom Weston and an American-born Mexican. Lee walked directly to the bar and ordered a drink. He drank it and ordered a second one before looking around the room to see if Allerton was there. Allerton was alone at the table, tipped back in a chair with one leg crossed over the other, holding a bottle of beer on his knee. He nodded to Lee. Lee tried to achieve a greeting at once, friendly and casual. Designed to show interest without pushing their short acquaintance, the result was ghastly. As Lee stood beside Debau in his dignified old world greeting, there emerged instead a leer of naked lust, wrenched in the pain and hate of his deprived body, and in simultaneous double exposure, a sweet child's smile of liking and trust, talkingly out of time and out of place, mutilated and hopeless. 
Allerton was appalled. Perhaps he is some sort of tick, he thought. He decided to re remove himself from the contact with Lee before the man did something even more distasteful. The effect was like a broken connection. Allerton was not cold or hostile. Lee Slimpy wasn't there for there so far as he was concerned. Lee looked at him helplessly for a moment, then turned back to the bar, defeated and shaken. Lee finished his second drink. When he looked around again, Allerton was playing chess with Mary, an American girl, with dyed red hair and carefully applied makeup, who had come into the bar in the meantime. Why waste time here, Lee thought. He paid for the two drinks and walked out. He took a cab to the Chimo Bar, which was a fag bar frequented by Mexicans, and spent the night with a young boy he met there. At the time, the GI students patronized Lola's during the daytime and the ship ahoy at night. Lola's was not exactly a bar. It was a small beer and soda joint. There was a Coca-Cola box full of beer and soda and ice and fat at the left of the door as he came in. A counter with two metal stools covered in yellow glazed leather ran down one side of the room as far as the jukebox. Tables were lined along the wall opposite. The counter, uh, the wall opposite the counter. The stools had long since lost the rubber caps for legs for the legs and made terrible screeching noises when the maid rushed them around the suite. There was a kitchen in the back where a slovenly cook fried everything in rancid fat. There was neither past nor future in Lola's. The place was a sitting room, was a waiting room, where certain people checked in at certain times. Several days after his pickup in the Chimo, he was sitting in Lola's reading aloud from Ultimus Noticias to Jim Cochan. There was a very, there was a short, there was a story about a man who murdered his wife and children. Colton looked about for a means to escape, but every time he made a move to go, Lee pinned him down with, get a load of this. When his wife came home from the market, her husband, already drunk, was brandishing his forty-five. Why do they always have to brandish it? Lee read to himself for a moment. Colton stirred uneasily. Jesus Christ, said Lee, looking up. After he killed his wife and three children, he takes a razor and puts it on, puts on a suicide act. He turned to the paper, but resulted only with scratches that did not require medical attention. What a slobbish performance! He turned the page and began reading the leads half loud. You're cutting the butter with Vaseline. Fine thing. Lobster with drawn KY. Here's a man with... Here's a man was surprised in his taco stand with a dressed-down dog. A great long skinny hound dog at that. Here's a picture of him posing in front of his taco stand with the dog. One citizen asked for another for a light. The party in the second part didn't have a match, so first part calls an ice pick and kills him. Murder is a national neurosis in Mexico. Cochin stood up. Lee was on his feet instantly. Sit down on your ass, or what's left of it after four years in the Navy, he said. I gotta go. What are you, hand-packed? No kidding, I've been out too much, lady. My lady. Lee wasn't listening. He had just seen Allerton stroll by outside the door and look in. Allerton had not greeted Lee, but walked on after a momentary pause. I was in the shadow, Lee thought. He couldn't see me from under the door. Lee did not notice Colchan's departure. On the sudden impulse, he rushed out the door. Allerton was half a block away. Lee overtook him. Allerton turned, raising his eyebrows, which were straight and black as a pen stroke. He looked surprised and a bit alarmed, since he was dubious of Lee's insanity. Lee improvised desperately. I just wanted to tell you, Mary, was in Lola's a little while ago. She asked me to tell you that she would be in a ship ahoy later on, around five. This was... Partly true. Mary had been in and had asked Lee if she had seen Allerton. Allerton was relieved. Oh, thank you, he said, quite cordial. Will you be around tonight? Yes, I think so. Lee nodded and smiled and turned away quickly. He left his apartment for the ship Ahoy just before five. Allerton was sitting at the bar. Lee, had down, Lee sat down and ordered a drink, then turned to Allerton with casual greeting as though they were on a familiar and friendly terms.
Alex in turn the greeting automatically before he realized that Lee had somehow established himself on a familiar basis, whereas he had previously decided to have as, as little do with Lee as possible. Allerton had a talent for ignoring people, but he was not competent in dislodging someone from a position already occupied. Lee began talking, casual, unpretentiously intelligent, dryly humorous. Slowly, he dispelled Allerton's impression that he was peculiar and his undesirable character. When Mary arrived, Lee greeted her with a tipsy old world gallantry and, excusing himself, left them to a game of chess. Who is she? asked Mary when Lee had gone outside. Who is he? Sorry. I have no idea, said Allerton. Had he ever met Lee? He could not be sure. Formal introductions were not expected among the GI students. Was Lee a student? Allerton had never seen him at the school. There was nothing unusual in talking with someone he didn't know, but Lee put Allerton on guard. The man was somehow familiar to him. When Lee talked, he seemed to mean more than what he said. A special emphasis to a word or a greeting hinted at a period of unfamiliarity in some other time and place. As though Lee were saying, you know what I mean, you remember, Allerton shrugged irritably and began arranging the chess pieces on the board. He looked like a sullen child, unable to locate the source of his ill temper. After a few minutes of play, his customary serenity returned, and he began humming. <coughs> Sorry. It was after midnight when Lee returned to the ship Ahoy. Drunk seethed around the bar, talking as if everyone else were to stone death. Allerton stood on the edge of his this group, apparently unable to make himself heard. He greeted Lee warmly, pushed into the bar, and emerged with two rum copes. Let's sit down here, he said. Allerton was drunk. His eyes were flushed a faint violet tinge. The pupils widely dilated. He was walking very fast in a high, thin voice, the airy, disembodied voice of a young child. Lee had never heard Allerton walk, talk like this before. The effect was like the possession voice of a medium. The boy had an in inhuman gaiety and innocence. Allerton was telling a story about his experience with a counterintelligent corpse in Germany and informed that it had been giving department bum steers. How did you check the accuracy of information, Lee asked. How did you know 90% of what your informants told you wasn't fabricated? Actually, we did it and we got sucked in on a lot of phony deals. Of course, we cross-checked all information with other informants and we had our own agents in the field. Most of our informants turned in some phony information, but this one character made it all up. He had our agents out looking for a whole fictitious network of Russian spies. So finally, the report comes back from Frankfurt. It is all a lot of crap, but instead of clearing out of town before the information could be checked, he came back with more. At this point, we'd really had enough of this bullshit, so we locked him up in the cellar, the room was pretty cold and uncomfortable, but that was all we could do. We had to handle prisoners carefully. He kept typing out confessions, enormous things. The story clearly delighted Allerton, and he kept laughing while he was telling it. Lee was impressed by his combination of intelligence and childlike charm. Allerton wasn't friendly now, without reserve or defense, like a child who had never been hurt. He was telling another story. Lee watched the thin hands, the beautiful violet eyes, and the flush of excitement in the boy's face. An imaginary hand projected with such force it seemed Allerton must feel the touch of the ectoplasmic fingers caressing his ear. Phantom thumbs smoothing his eyebrows, pushing the hair back from his face. Now Lee's hands were running down over the ribs, the stomach. He felt the aching pain of desire in his lungs. His mouth was a little open showing his teeth and half-snarl of a baffled animal. He licked his lips. He did not enjoy frustration. The limitations of, the of his desires were like the bars of a cage, like a chain and collar, something he had learned as an animal learns through days and years of experience the snub of the chain, the unyielding bars. He had never resigned himself, and his eyes looked out through the invisible bars, watching, alert, waiting for the keeper to, to forget the door. For the frayed collar, the loosened bar, suffering without despair and without consent. I went to the door, and there he was with a branch in his mouth, Allerton was saying. Lee had not been listening. A branch in his mouth, Sidley, then added 
inanely a big branch. It was about two feet. I told him to drop dead. Then a few minutes later, he had appeared at the window. So I threw a chair at him, and he jumped down into the yard from the balcony, about 18 feet. He was very nimble, almost inhuman. It was short of uncanny, and that's why I drew through the chair. I was scared. We all figured he was putting on an act to get out of the army. What did he look like? We asked. Looked like? I don't remember especially. He was around 18. He looked like a clean-cut boy. We threw a bucket of cold water on him and left him on the cot downstairs. He began flopping around, but he didn't say anything. We all decided that was an appropriate punishment. I think they took him to the hospital the next day. Pneumonia? I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't have thrown water on him. Lee left Allerton at the door of his building. You go in there? Lee asked. Yes, I have a sack there. He said a good night and walked home. After that, Lee met Allerton every day at five in the ship ahoy. Allerton was accustomed to choose his friends from people older than himself, and he took look forward to meeting me. Lee had conversational routines that Allerton had never heard, but he felt at times oppressed by Lee, as though Lee's presence shut off everything else. He thought he was seeing too much of Lee. Allerton disliked commitments, and had never been in love or had a close friend. He was now forced to ask himself, what does he want from me? It did not occur to him that Lee was queer as he associated queerness with at least some degree of overt effeminacy. He decided finally that Lee valued him as an audience. And I'll do chapter, start chapter 3 next time. Thank you for listening. Have a good night.